There Hi, it Hi. <laughs> There's a, there it is. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the line between art and art, a hands-on exploration of abstract thought with the talented Courtney Francis Fallon and the equally talented Vera Albrecht. Um, my name is Joy Harris, and this presentation is the fifth in a series of dialogues that have emerged from my project, Possessing a Common Logic which is a project that aims to bring together artists and thinkers across disciplines to consider commonalities in their practice. And this project is supported by the Houston Arts Alliance and was a recipient of the Let Creativity Happen grant. So that's exciting. Um, so to get started, let me introduce presenters. Um, we're gonna start with Vera. So um, Vera received a master's degree in philosophy, Indology and ancient Greek from Albertus Magnus Universitat. I can say that somewhat correctly, in Cologne, and a PhD in philosophy from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Her areas of specialization are metaphysics and object theory, philosophy of language and aesthetics. She teaches philosophy of law and philosophy of art, of philosophy of art at LaGuardia Community College in Queens, New York. She's been writing about non-existent objects, the nature of objects of art, as well as on truth and fiction. So. Thank you, Vera, for being here. Hi. Um, next, we have Courtney Francis Fallon. She's a writer, director, artist, and performer whose creative practice involves activism. Originally from Buffalo, she spent several years living and traveling abroad to over 40 countries and most of the US before settling down roots in Brooklyn. Her mother emigrated to the US as a child refugee, which made Fallon acutely aware of the absurdity and injustices of political systems. Being immersed in other cultures further radicalized her and ultimately motivated her, <laughs> excuse me, motivated her to direct her artistic practice towards activist goals. Her work frequently employs a surreal cartoon like absurdity to discuss and dissect tragedies and devastations. Ridiculousness allows the work to be aggressive and or didactic without alienating, boring, or condescending the audience. That's very true. She's a proud member of the Dramatist Guild. So, Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Vera. Um, so glad that you're sharing your talent and your energy with us tonight. And thank you, Saul. Joy. Yes, thanks thank you for having us. Being here. Okay, so house, housekeeping yeah. items for everyone. We're all like Zoom experts, but um, please feel free to use the chat in any way you want um, while we're doing this. Um, we'll, Courtney and Vera, we're taking questions at the end, right? But if something comes up, I'm sure y'all will just kind of deal with that on the fly, if that makes sense, right? Um, don't forget to mute your mic. I'm going to do that to myself as well. Um, and of course, you don't have to have your video on if you don't want, but we love to see smiling faces. So we're not talking to uh, blank screens. So before I hand this over to Courtney and Vera, I want to make a few comments. Um, I try not to talk too much at the beginning, but I'm going to make an exception because I'm so excited about this conversation. Um, this I've had a lot of really great programs, including the one that Nessa Voss was in um, on um, um, a couple of months ago. And she's on the call. Hi, Nessa. Um, but I'm, uh, yeah, I'm particularly interested in this topic because of my research in um, on Hannah Arendt and performance art. So Hannah Arendt's a 20th century political theorist. She's probably best known for her work, The Origins of Totalitarianism, or on the concept, the banality of evil. But I'm interested in Arendt's concept of the work of art. And she thinks that the work of art is a specific object that is made by the hands of a creative person and that's it. And that the work of art is different from action, right? And that these, these things are very separate and we are absolutely going to talk about this tonight. Um, I think that Arendt had a really old fashioned version of art and that does not reflect contemporary and didn't even really reflect art that was happening while she was writing and teaching at the new school in the 1970s, which um, right, yeah, right around the corner, um, per early performance artists were doing really radical work that had political um, subtext. And so I think we should just show Ms. Arendt that she's just a little wrong today. So um, <laughs> with that, I'm going to hand it over to y'all. I'm going to take my screen away and um, mute my mic and you've got the, you got the stage. Here I'm gonna okay start up yeah, the you, screen share for you, Vera, and yes, then that'd be my great. mic. That'd be great. So I mean, 
traditionally, I mean, I'm coming from this area of philosophy and traditionally it's the big question regarding art is what is art? What is beauty? And since it was in, in the little, um, uh, you know, um, when, when we started out, what's the difference really between art, lowercase art, lower, up, uppercase art? And is there really such a distinction? And we just came to the conclusion, especially Courtney and I, we talked about it. We saw, you know, the line between art and art is really a blue line. Thank you forward. It's just, it's just a blue line, nothing big. And it's kind of the distinction is in a way mute, be, or it's kind of such an artificial distinction that we think, you know, here we are the theorists, we have the theorists. And what uh, Hannah Arendt was saying is like these, or she was a little bit caught in that tradition. And the tradition is really the question, what is art, what is beauty? But in the 20th century, all these movements, you know, Dada, Fluxes, um, Duchamp, they kind of put this, all these definitions that we had kind of yeah, throw them out to the garbage because, well, if that's art, well, it, none of the definitions work anymore. So ultimately, you can just, can you forward, um, we just come to the conclusion can be art. And if anything can be art, what then makes the difference between like huh, this class and a work of art? And maybe Danto captured it he, and kind of included these 20th century movements to say, well, the work of art is one that is declared a work of art and that is, you know, intended a work of art by the artist. So now we kind of change that question around and say, the question really is not what is art, but if anything can be art, why art? Why should there be art? What for? What's that all good for? And at that point, I'm just going to hand it over to Courtney because we want to talk about that blue line that really is drawn, can be drawn anywhere, even between lowercase art and uppercase art. And okay, so um, we're going to, you can hear me and we're okay on the slides, everything's okay. So for the sake of this conversation, we're gonna talk about a project I did in 2017 called Draw the Blue Line. It was a participatory art action protesting US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. And it, for a little bit of context to remind you of terrible times, <laughs> on June 7th, to, on June 1st, 2017, Donald Trump declared that the United States withdraw from the Paris Accord. And immediately people started protesting. One of the things that he said was, I was elected by the voters of Pittsburgh, not Paris. And people started protesting right away. The mayor of Pittsburgh was like, oh, we're, we're cool with the Paris Agreement, actually. We're going to stick with it. And we, you know, so. Um, so I decided to, I was inspired to do this art action. And this was a big change for me as a writer and a playwright and a director who had dabbled in visual art. I had never done activist projects, but I got this idea to do Draw the Blue Line, which asked it was people to put horizontal blue lines during the UN, the 2017 UN General Assembly to show support for the Paris Agreement across buildings, trees, fences, windows, and on social media. So here's some examples. This is an apartment building in Brooklyn. Here is a wine store in the financial district. Here is Soho. And this is on the subway, New York Blue. This was an ad for the professional soccer team in New York. This is a sign, a road sign near the UN, rough road ahead, we're in trouble, sea levels are rising. And the whole goal of the project was to make the blue line so ubiquitous in New York City and online that members of the UN would see them and respond by reaffirming their commitment to the Paris Agreement. So you'd kind of be like walking around, you'd be like, do you see those blue lines? What is, what is that about? And um, 
that leads us, we'll, we'll go more into that after this, but this leads into some other questions from Vera. I'm gonna unmute myself. So, and this gets the question, I mean, for the theorist like myself is what is a work of art anyway? So what sort of an object is that? And this is maybe easier, you know, not as easy as it seems on a first view when we look at a painting, right? So it's, it's a painting that represents anything or not. But in the case of performance art, this kind of, or the draw the blue line is, I mean, what kind of, what's the thing, what's the object here that we're looking at that is, and even if we go with Danto's definition that if it's intended a work of art, if it's declared a work of art, hey, it's a work of art, but what is it? So what is this, all these, is it the blue lines or? What function is it? Should it be defined like in terms of the function? Does it do anything? And of course, what's the value of it? I mean, aesthetics has you know always been a value theory that we say, and you know the traditional values are like beautiful, uh, beautiful, which is completely kind of outmoded by right now. But this really poses the question: How do we value this? And of course, who is the artist? If you know in this initial thing that Courtney did, she's clearly the artist. I mean, she draws these blue lines. And of course, it's not the object itself, not even in the case of a painting, but what is behind it. This aboutness is also the case that we can hold on to in Courtney's project or in any performance arts that it's what's about, it's the content. And of course, ultimately we can say it's what is expressed in the end. So I put that over to you. So we should keep these questions in mind when we talk about it and maybe look a little bit more at. So, yeah, this is, this goes into like, there were a lot of different aspects of draw the blue line. It wasn't just, um, so the social media element opened it up th the project to people outside of New York. And also, as we know, in the world at this time, participation online begets action offline, the two work together. And so here we have a classroom in Western New York. Here we have a chicken coop in Oswego, New York. And then it was participation was also open to objects, not just real estate for aesthetic and accessibility reasons. So if you're a teenager who lives in a red household or a climate denying household, you could have popped a blue line across your window and left it up, or you could do a light bulb or a mailbox or a car or anything. So lines could be very temporary, just long enough for a picture to be taken. So that also added another element to it that you, this is ribbon in a fence in Transmitter Park in Brooklyn. That was just up for the photo. This is garbage I found on a sidewalk I found. Um, this is one of my favorites. This was a friend of mine, she was on an airplane and she knew I was doing this project and she was like, once you start seeing blue lines, it's impossible not to or ways to do it. And so we also had um, digital blue lines to open up the project even more. So again, this is a participatory art action. We need it to be easy for people to do and we need to gain this traction and this steam. So it, this was, uh, a piece that I had commissioned. This is a satire, or a parody of Harold and the Purple Crayon. This is just a line from an article about climate change that just is about the fact that there are all these different projections and um, about what the blue lines could, like of what sea levels will rise to. This is a classroom activity that I hired an educator to design. This is for K through 12 and it could be done in any class. It could have been done in a science class, a, current, a history class as a current event lesson, an art class. So it has this, um, this text where we're talking about what's happening 
And then also it on the other page, it would have children that have the opportunity to draw a blue line, anything they want just to represent sea levels rising. And also people were encouraged to flood the line. So if you drew a blue line somewhere, you were encouraged in installations or whatever to fill in the space below. And there, this, I was talking a little bit about this, that there are different projections as the sea levels would rise to. So whatever you wanted to do for sea levels. So um, this is just about, this is like another digital example with Trump uh, lying about why we shouldn't be in the Paris Agreement and what happened then. So I, I was trying to recruit people. And so the UN General Assembly is was September 12th to the 25th. It's generally every September, it takes over New York City. And so I spent the weeks leading up to it, modeling different blue lines and putting up gorilla blue lines throughout New York City as a way to recruit participants. Um, here I am on the subway. Uh, maybe you'll recognize this dress because um, I am corny like that. So I'm going to wear a blue dress while I'm putting up blue lines. Um, this was a sticker somebody put up somewhere and I added to it. This is a moving truck that I tagged and it had that blue tape on it for years. I see it all the time in Brooklyn. Um, I also put up pull tabs and put up banners, put these up throughout New York City so people could see it and potentially get an idea and join in or find out if they're curious. And this is performance art, art artist Martha Wilson doing a performance where she is Donald Trump. And so I asked her to put this blindfold on. So she's literally a blindfold Trump. And also she's very generous to support me. And play and variation were also encouraged. So blue lines didn't even like need to be horizontal like sea levels. Um, this is a question mark that was a post I did from a pool noodle I got out of the garbage. I was also trying to be aware of the waste stream and I didn't want my project about climate change to contribute to the waste stream and make a lot of garbage. So I was calling for materials and donations or trash. This is a, a digital line and it is actually a sad face. If you look closely, the little eyes are right here um, because global wine production was dropping because of climate change. And I just can't imagine anything worse. I can because this is a, uh, an existential crisis, but just throw it on the pile of reasons why climate change is the worst. Um, this was actually just a map from the New York Times about um, hurricanes that we were experiencing. At this time we had, um, Houston was rocked by a hurricane and it was a really bad time. So, and it's all related to climate change. Um, this is, I'm left-handed and I had blue all over my hands. So I'm like, oh, this is a blue line. Like you really do see them everywhere. And um, do you wanna take a break? Do you wanna pop back in? Vera, before I get into how I got really conceptual in the performance elements of it? Well, I, I just, while we're on that blue line, I hope you all can see this big blue line right behind me. It's a big blue line. Can you hear me? Yeah, big blue line. So now, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I'm just out of town. This is obviously not New York City. Um, and, but the interesting thing here is uh, that you can, you, I mean, it raises the question, who's really the artist here? I mean, who's the artist of, of this blue line or, or even some of these other blue lines that other people did that Courtney kind of uh, inspired these cool kids to, uh, you know, glue these blue lines on. And it's, that's not even something that new in the, you know, when we talk about conceptual art. I mean, obviously Michelangelo didn't, did the whole ceiling of the Sistine Ch Ch Chapel by himself. So it was, he had workers. Can you hear me? I was saying, no, I won't hear it. Michelangelo did everything by himself. He was a genius. He's perfect. Of course, no, but no, he, he didn't. I mean, he, uh, people had people working for them. They 
kind of had the idea and ultimately i mean that's what conceptual coming up with the idea so yes courtney is the the artist here but of course it does pose the question what is the work of text the question we don't have anything tangible and that's a, also by the way the beauty of banks is banksy's self-destructing uh <laughs> work of art so it's not about the work of art um that you you have something tangible it's really always about the idea and what it expresses so um it's not yeah it's 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 not really something tangible, but the work of art. Hold on, over there. Sorry, it's like our dog's getting lost here. <laughs> so, um, Vera's yeah, in Maine, everybody. So She's joining us from her vacation. So, Courtney's thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I'm on vacation. My little one week vacation. So, um, <laughs> so. And it's, yeah, it's almost hard to be serious. But, but anyway, I think me, it's just, and of course, say in a way, it takes off. I mean, what started with something, and we can just, you you're breaking up on us a little bit, Vera. Can you hear me? So, I mean, for me as a... You know, Vera, can you hear me? You're yes, breaking I up on us a little bit. Okay, um, why don't you take over? Okay. Um, or do you just want to repeat what you said a little bit? Because I was into it. And we're doing great on time. Okay, I'm muted now. You can hear me now. Okay, I'm just thinking, you know, that, and this is what for the, I mean, the theorist is kind of, of course, you know, challenged by defining what is art, who's the artist, all these questions. But I think, and if you think, well, is this blue line? Is this, is that Courtney's work? <laughs> so just to be a little facetious, but it's of course the sky, she didn't make the sky, but it's the fact that we can now see it as a blue line with the project she started is just in a way you can say, to it that and our association that we can have with any object outside of it so um yeah i'm sorry if i'm breaking up sometimes but yeah do you want to continue with with more uh, oh this is joy i have stuff? a i have a question from nessa that i don't she, it's actually relevant to what you were just okay. saying vera so nessa are you still on or were you kicked off i can ask for you if you'd like um, just ask for me because i keep getting kicked on and off okay. so Okay, I will ask in your I will ask for you. So um, um, Nessa's question is, I'm curious to hear about the creation of art without an object. So things that are in dialogue, concept, non physical, but still participate in the art historical tradition. So I felt like, um, oh, it's okay that that kind of fit in with what Vera was talking about right at that moment. So maybe Vera, you want to respond to that just really quickly, and then we can proceed. I think we don't really need the object anyway. I mean, as, as you all know, if, you, if we think about uh, fiction, right, these objects don't exist like a, a novel. It's not something that really exists. And of course, it's not the, you know, the printed matter, but it's really what's behind it, what's expressed, what we can kind of, what we can imagine. It's, it's, it goes all to our imagination or what triggers this. Right. And I think we don't need the object at all. I mean, you know what? My specialty are non-existent objects. And this is how I actually got drawn into aesthetics and the philosophy of art. Because we, it's not the object, it's not the physical object, but it's really about what the object does. It's the properties and 
the, uh, the well, the expressiveness, and I wanted to get that to that later. And that's where, you know, the, the political activism comes in that, um, that Courtney is doing. So um, about that later when she gets into the activist uh, part of this project and other And you're a little bit frozen. I'm going to take this time now and get into how with the remainder of the project, which is basically once variation and play were invited and ex like welcome, and eventually things got real conceptual. And so um, I got a ton of ribbon, this beautiful, like three inch, four inch thick ribbon. For, uh, to do an installation in a fence. And I realized that it would be perfect for like a beauty queen sash. And then I realized that that would is not quite as satisfying as a suffragette style sash. And so I made one, but I couldn't figure out who to get it for. I was actually at one point trying to do a beauty queen um, sash and trying to figure out if I could recruit somebody who would have like a crown and um, put one on and then the suffragette sash hit me and then this was um, when Fearless Girl was in New York City and uh, she's then moved but she was directly across from the Wall Street Bowl at the time and in the process of measuring her to uh, make it fit her I started thinking that I could do something with the Wall Street Bowl. And I got this idea to, um, to kind of tar and feather the Wall Street Bowl with chalk. I had this huge, like this construction chalk. So I had like large amounts of powdered chalk and it, you know, it's like two o'clock in the morning. So I get, I go to a bodega and I get corn oil, hoping it would stick, um, that it would, throw and that it would stick. And then I post uh, about it that, you know, to go along with the caption that um, be bullheaded in the face of climate change denial and demand action. Now we have this image and it was the process of doing it was a piece of performance vandalism. So um, that was the whole act from there. And so again, for the, this piece, getting real conceptual and back to you, Vera. Uh, I, I just want to remark this one thing about the, the bull um, that when Courtney and I, we talked about that first, she said, well, I didn't really think that the bull was, you know, you know, visually pleasing. And I thought, I thought just the opposite. I mean, it intrigued me because it looked a little bit like someone shed on, on the bull's head, like an, an enormous bird with blue poop. Obviously. With, uh, and, and there are like the connotations with climate change denial is very much driven by capitalism. And but to me, I just feel like it was a first draft exactly. that it got too much attention. But but Vera likes it more than me, which is really great. <laughs> yeah, so I thought it, it has some visual uh, intriguing stuff. But uh, I mean, now we can look at it and can say, so do we have any answers now? And of course, for philosophy, there's never any answers. I mean, it's always open and there's always, if we ever get so lucky to get an answer, there's gonna be more questions. So what is a work of art? And in, in, in this case of Draw the Blue Line, there's not even any one thing, but it's this whole you know, conglomerate of different things that all kind of point to the, the same kind of content. So it's really about the content and what kind of objects, no, it's almost the wrong question if you ask about what object it is. So um, ultimately uh, we say function, uh, can we say the function, but it's really, again, not really the function, but it's really about expressing something. 
And when you express something, you can say, so what's the difference between writing an essay and doing this project where so many people do so many different acts? that have like, oh, you go ahead. And also, I don't know if I was super clear too, it's, it was also a call and response. So the idea was that right. very specifically, I, well, I you know, wanted yeah. members of the UN to see it. And then I wanted them to reply by drawing their own blue line at their, uh, at their headquarters in New York City or bringing up the Paris Agreement and asking them to reaffirm their commitment to the Paris Agreement. Right, so it's, it's a dialogue and that is very, and of course, ultimately can say, what's so unique about this? And while if as a propositional statement, statement like in an answer, we really need to worry about climate change and we have to do something about it. People are in their pigeonhole, so they, they're either for it or against it, and there's this clear cut, kind of almost pre made or prefabricated um, attitude they have towards it, which they cannot have with a work of art because it's not so clear cut. It has so many different levels, so many different facets. So the beautiful thing is that it also because it's a little ambiguous, so it makes us think or the intention is of course make us think and to be intrigued, to be curious. And that doesn't have a yes or no answer. So it's perhaps even more effective if we can get some kind of say message, but some kind of impression across. And um, so the value of it is, well, that's, uh, I wouldn't say up to the uh, observer, but it's the value that it can do that. It can affect something. So that's big these days. And of course, who's an artist? Well, here that, that's anybody. Anybody can do that. And anybody who has an idea can be an artist. And it's not the person who something. It's not the person who puts the paint on the canvas. It's anybody who has an idea and is able to kind of, you know, uh, project that and have people think about things. And that's a, I mean, climate change is obviously a very important issue. As you can see here, this big blue line right behind me. I don't know if you can see the water level because there's also a water right behind me. All right, I turn it over to you, Kurt. So um, in this uh, whole situation uh, was this new, this is getting, veering a little way, a little bit from the topic. It's impossible to talk about this project without talking about the post-performance blowback, which offered a lot of invaluable lessons about art advocacy as I was beginning this part of my creative practice. Um, so here I am um, also in this dress with the Wall Street Bull. So this is some surveillance footage that I was able to acquire from the New York City Department, uh, Police Department. And when I did this, I knew that you could get a $75 ticket for littering. And I thought that that was what would happen at worst because I used food and chalk and was not going to be causing any damage. And although this was the week after people had put red paint on the hands of the Christopher Columbus statue in Central Park. And I think that that was awesome, uh, but that wasn't what I was doing and was not trying to, I really saw this as like an act of like benign civil disobedience. I really didn't think anyone would care. And I thought maybe I would get a ticket. I'm putting my name on it. So you know who did it and you know how to find me. So I wasn't expecting this controversy and um, within, within 12 hours, I started to get my first hate mail ever. So here is from somebody named Jean, you know, hoping that I should have to compensate somebody for the charges resulting from my vandalism. It was like clean within an hour or something. That isn't to say that that 
It's cool to like make somebody clean up after you, but again, pretty benign. And also I started to get this blowback that I wasn't anticipating. <laughs> this is from somebody on the other side of the spectrum saying like, you idiots, everyone is gonna think this is law enforcement related. That's like saying, put, that's like put up an evergreen with lights and ornaments in your home to protest deforestation, duh. And uh, draw the blue line. The, the thin blue line is now is very much something that's entrenched in New York City police culture, but I am the daughter of a retired police officer and that wasn't part of his station, his like uh, department's culture. But just after I was arrested, there were protests for the murder of Michael Brown in Missouri and, um, and somebody was burning like a, uh, a thin blue line a uh, flag. So it was very much like, oh yeah, I really didn't name this well. And then, um, so I was getting all this blowback and hearing from reporters and waiting for the police to get in touch with me. And I was also about to release the, uh, um, the classroom activity for kids to do in schools, hoping it would catch on. So it felt really unsavory to have caused this controversy and also be like, hey kids, teachers involve your kids. Like, it's great. So I put out a press release being like, hey, yeah, that was dumb. And this was the image that I used for, to accompany the press release, which my blue line was underlying, like underlining naive artist from a uh, Polish dictionary. I love this Polish dictionary. The uh, definitions and examples they give are wild. So like, for example, on the bottom, it's like, She's so gullible that she allows everyone to take advantage of her. Like that's a pretty intense uh, example sentence uh, dictionary. So I, this is what I did. And um, I also learned the hard way that you should not put out a press release without talking to your lawyer because, or a lawyer, because when you get arrested, it is going to be used against you. It's going to create problems. And I had my first interactions with the paparazzi and as, uh, as Vera was saying um, this, that, and I, I, I got arrested. Uh, I, I did it on a Thursday morning. By Friday, the police got in touch with me and they call you up and ask you to go to the police station. And it just caused a lot more blowback than I expected. It also basically killed the project. I had created a really large, um, uh, these really large letters that said draw the blue line that I was going to install in a basketball court near the UN and my lawyer was like don't go there don't even be in the same neighborhood and as I was saying uh I uh don't I did not think it was visually interesting uh here you can't read the sash it was terrible so you can't read the sash and i hate the way the bull doesn't look very visually interesting to me or the blue doesn't carry i could have used different materials maybe vera and then it would look more dumpy or more chalk but you only really get one shot so it was just a, i was it was really embarrassing and really a disaster and then also um it was beautifully unnecessary this particular project because Every single country in the UN, except for the United States, like, and Syria, spent their time speaking at the UN General Assembly in 2017, talking about their commitment to the Paris Agreement and doubling down on it. And at the time that the United States withdrew, the only two countries who weren't in on it were Syria and Honduras. And Honduras had not signed for, um, out of protest because they didn't feel that the Paris Agreement was strong enough. And following the United States announcement of withdrawing, and we're fine now, um, which was not clear in 2017 that we would be where we are at this moment and we're still in a lot of trouble. But uh, Honduras actually went on to sign the Paris Agreement because of the United States withdrawal. So it was delightfully, wonderfully, blissfully unnecessary. And that that's great. So it was great. It was great that I had to pull the plug on it, basically, because it was unnecessary. But okay. And then, um, getting into arts activism, I know for me personally, it was 
a shift from my creative practice because it is so unbelievably laborious to make work. And so if I'm going to make work, I want it to count for something. So, um, and be towards something. So I have continued on with my arts activism and I'm growing and improving all the time. Um, in fact, somebody here is from a political like artists who do performance based work that is um, politi political and activist based. And here is some video, some drone footage of a, an installation that I did in downtown Houston that was anti-Trump and pro-impeachment. And so um, it's called, I called it Easy Credit. Ooh, there we go. And so it's Trump and co, we've got a Putin there going out of business and he is basically a, a puppet and the it, it's all a play on the facade of this building in downtown Houston um, where it's the home of easy credit because this was in response to at the time Trump just saying like oh yeah I believe Putin or you know um, Kim Jong-un is fine everything's fine like he would just give credit to anybody he wanted to and that included like Recep Erdogan of, of Turkey so on and so forth he would just like believe people who he wanted to and that's because he's a dick bag and then <laughs> i also got into this is right after the election this was a volunteer i volunteered for another artist's project this was called cheer the count and it was getting people to go out immediately after the election in those days between november 3rd and the end when the election was called that Saturday. So people were going out and then here you're trying to um, encourage enthusiasm and patience for a correct and accurate count, cheering on democracy. So I signed up for that. I had the cheerleading uniform from a different performance I had done. Um, and I just happened to wear this cheerlead this shield for COVID. So I end up looking like a really dystopian cheerleader. And then after that, I signed up. I also participated in projector vote. This was immediately after the election as well. From the, this is, these are all projects from the Unstoppable Voters campaign, which was an initiative from the Center for Artistic Action. And again, I'm a volunteer. This was not my project, um, but I really took it to the, like the limit and did the, the most I could. So these were projections that were uh, celebrating that the voters had decided and here is one example at the Rocky Steps. Here is another example on a uh, town hall in Philadelphia, which is quite an iconic building. Uh, the ironic build, ugh, iconic, <laughs> it's an ironic building. It's an iconic building, but the, and the National Guard had been there called in for protests the week before related to another police brutality and, um, murder at the hands of police. And as you can see, it says the people have spoken. And uh, yeah, so those are just some like quick examples of some of my more recent activist work. I'm gonna stop the share there. And- hey, can, I, can I just quickly pick up on just yeah. as one comment, because you said, well, it's was blissfully unnecessary. So, does it have to be necessary to be valid? I mean, first of all, of course, you don't know in advance, but maybe it was necessary or not necessary. Does it really matter? I mean, necessity, does that really make it um, an important issue? I don't think so. Right, that and that actually leads me to the question that I want to ask. ask. Um, which is, you know, and I, I love to be the host of these because I get to be the devil's advocate because clearly I chose both of you because I think you're brilliant, but I now also get to ask you hard questions, which is, I think that um, we oh, could, oh, yes, we want to, before we get into the questions, I can pop up the surveillance video at silent. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. So I was able to eventually get my performance documentation, a big part of performance art is that you need to have documentation in the form of film or video or video or photos, but I couldn't do that. It was, you know, dawn and everything was moving really quick. So eventually 
through the wonder of the Freedom of Information Act, I was able to get um, Um, I'm trying to, am I sharing my desktop? I should Yes, be. you're sharing your desktop. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to share this. So eventually I was able to get this video, uh, the surveillance video from that night and we can play it, uh, real quick. It, this is my performance documentation courtesy of the New York city police department. Thanks to the freedom of information act. And then Joy, yeah, pop into your question. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I think that we're talking about we're talking about materiality or lack thereof. We're talking about sort of function or lack thereof, purpose, lack thereof, etc. Um, I'm always thinking about what performative politics means, and that to me that seems like a pretty um, a pretty good word to describe what you're doing. I mean, it is activist, but it is performative and you are trying to have a political discourse because you are asking people to participate in that with you. But would you say that this type of performative politics is just a way that um, we've adapted to, I don't want to say just digital culture, but we've adapted to mass culture, that we've adapted to um, that it's less about the discourse and more about an adaptation of discourse in order to make that discourse more effective. That it's not, do you see what I'm saying? That it's not necessarily a new line of political discourse, but it's just something that it's a it's political discourse that has been escalated and sensationalized in order to be effective just because there's so many things going on at the same time. I think that that's a very cynical way of looking at it, but I do think that there are people who would look at a project like this and say, you wanted to do something on climate change you did something radical so that you could you know get in the news or whatever and you just yeah that whole thing like you just this isn't really art this is just about you trying to be seen and you trying to get your point across i mean what i i, I have to believe that someone has said something like that to you in the past so what is your sort of what would your response to that be there are a few things um the real big thing is that new york city is going to flood New York City is going to be gone. We're in deep trouble. And um, that is really what it comes down to. So I, if you, I wanted to viscerally really have these blue lines everywhere to really think about this is going to be underwater. Mm -hmm. I got this idea in very early July, 2017. And a month later, I moved to Greenpoint, which is in Brook North Brooklyn, it's like the, it's on the East River and Newtown Creek, and it's a flood zone. And my renter's insurance would, I was going to lose my policy uh, if I lived on one of the first two floors. And then shortly after that, I did move to an apartment on the second floor, and I did have to get different renter's insurance. State Farm will not cover you if you live in Greenpoint on the first or second floor. Interesting. And so there is this odd element of you want a work to get attention, but you don't want to work to get attention for the sake of attention. And that's why this was so embarrassing because I didn't think anyone was going to care about this. And I def like, I was so wrong. <laughs> and I was so naive. I thought it would be like a dumb thing and be like, this dumb lady did that, but it's going to take like 20 minutes to clean up. So we're fine. And like, maybe she'll get a ticket. So as far as performative part of politics being a part of our time, there is an element of that, but those that's not even new or unique either. Okay, um, Vera, do you want to respond to that as well? Yeah, I, I just want to say, if you say, you know, performative politics, I mean, is it effective? I think the best politics could really be to make people think, and this is a Politics. We're losing you a little bit. I hate it. I want to hear what you have to say. Uh, in their kind of in a particular kind of way of thinking. So um, I think uh, I think that's that alone would just already qualify for being kind of very effective kind of political discourse if you make people just think about stuff and i mean by the way as you said you know flooding i mean 
uh, Hurricane Sandy should have been a big, big warning to New Yorkers. I mean, some areas were completely flooded underwater. I mean, uh, the south of Manhattan was underwater. So that should, should have been kind of a big kind of idea to think about stuff. Um, Jimmy so, had a comment that he wanted to make. I wanted to say something really quickly before I go to you, Jimmy, is that um, I want to I want to sort of make a little teaser to Vera that I would I would propose since I'm the devil's advocate here that perhaps this is less discur discursive and more rhetorical, like to the degree that so I think Courtney's intention is to have a discourse right but that when the work becomes just about performing the work, just the work saying something, it becomes more of a, it becomes more rhetorical. And the rhetorical tradition is necessarily performative because you're speaking it and you're trying to convince people of something. So I think that in cases like this, there's this very thin line between that which is performative politically and that which is rhetorical. So I bet I, I could talk about this forever. So, but Jimmy should talk. Um. So one thing that comes to mind to me is how many laws are proposed, discussed, voted on, and passed from the, the conservative side of things in silence. And I just want to applaud, I, I know Courtney talk, has talked to me a lot about this project and she's mentioned like the embarrassment of the, the situation with the bowl, but to me, at least we're we're making it visible what we're trying to do here, right? As opposed to the other side that has, has systematically, and I mean, aside from climate change, if you look at gerrymandering, if you look at voting rights, if you look at, um, honestly, and including climate change too, to be completely honest, there's a lot of laws that they've passed having to do with coal miners and things that are just kind of hushed hushed throughout, um, throughout like the media and such. Uh, I, I really think that that is dirty politics and that the only way to try and regain some some respect for ourselves is to have a discussion and so at the very least at least Courtney is attempting the discussion and attempting to have some sort of communication and, and speech about it instead of just letting it pass through by these old rich white men making their own lives better with no concern whatsoever for anyone outside of that. Um, I think that for this particular piece, because it's climate change and it is, it's necessarily biological, environmental. I think that the use of body art to sort of anthropomorphize something that we think is very artificial, right? We think of that science is very abstract and rational when it is in actuality very embodied. So the use of performance practices to discuss this sort of abstract notion is very powerful. So I'm even thinking of what you said about gerrymandering, which is where we're very much abstracting what a person is, where they live, you know, yep. sort of trying to figure out how they're gonna vote and that's how we're gonna draw the line. So I think that performance practice in particular is very powerful in its ability to provide some sort of tangibility to something that is very real, that it does affect bodies, but that it's not seen as such. So, so I agree. I think that the work is very, is very powerful um, in that way. And that we should be concerned with things that are, with things that are hidden um, because we do hide our bodies. So thank you. Thank you for that. Well, yeah. yeah. And especially during that particular time in, in, the United States. Um, I feel like every single headline out there was about Republicans, was about Trump, was about it, like even like I just love that there that like this maybe wasn't the exact attention Courtney was desiring with the project, but it, it gave a voice to the other side to an extent. And it let the left side have a headline at all which I think was very important during that time because just everything was so focused on the other side. Well, you know? I'm going to push back on that because I think that what ended up happening is that everything was so anti-Republicanism and anti-Trump and anti-administration that people who had something significant to say that was like had its own agency, which is what Courtney is trying to do, that got lost. It the the unique yeah. singularity of its thought was lost in this in this sort of conversation that was necessarily reactive, which not only bolsters the the thing that you're reacting against, but it also 
um, diminishes the voices of people who are trying to get to trying to proactively speak because I think that personally I think that that's a huge problem and that we are so concerned with saying everyone is terrible everyone is doing all these things wrong that we don't have a lot of voices where people are saying this is something that's happening this is what we should do and then Courtney what's great about this project is Courtney's like this is a problem this is what we should do this is how you can attack it artistically this is how you can attack it educationally this is how you can attack it attack it in an activist manner like there there were all these different ways that she was proactively trying to make a statement yes Vera yes sorry <laughs> No, I, I just want to want to pick up what, on what Jimmy said, and, and this is true. I mean, at the time, everything was like either pro or anti-Trump. It was just either the one or the other. And I think this is why works of art or in, in general, this wasn't pro-Trump or against Trump. It wasn't something that was, it was blue lines. And that's what I think is so much more effective because it doesn't, usually people are already so settled in their opinions. And this is one that you can't even, well, of course you can say that's crap, that's, that's awful. And just one other thing of, of what Jimmy said, it's, you know, it, it's the, it kind of, most of the politics um, and especially during those Trump years was kind of to profit for those already rich old white guys. Um, and in a way, I, this is why I like the, the, the bull project because it's kind of, yeah, in the end, you know, climate change will shit on you. <laughs> and, and, you know, you will lose much more profits, but of course it's very short sighted because in the short term, of course you make more profits if you don't take care of the environment. It will shit right on yeah. your head. So yeah. Courtney, I, I was gonna say, I'd love one more quick little response there. Yeah, I'm so yeah. sorry. I wanted to say, um, Joy, thank you for what you said, because I'm, I'm going to do something that is a little unheard of nowadays. I'm, I'm going to take that information you said and I'm going to change my opinion. Um, I completely agree with you that it was uh, it, it was not it was not put into the media the right way. And with that, one of the other uh, little notes that I had made during the presentation is actually kind of goes back to the whole title of this presentation is the line between art and art. Um, I wrote how to clarify intention with activist art, mm -hmm. or does clarifying the intention take away the meaning of the art so that really goes back to like the whole art versus activism thing right there too so just to kind of full circle it i just i didn't wanted to bring it back no and it also brings up discourse versus rhetoric right Maybe, so yeah. is it a question of uh, an action a performative action that has political content that's being used in a I don't mean it's a negative way, but in an ideological manner, right? It's being used to communicate something specifically with the intention of changing someone's mind. Like that is its intent. It's not to ask a question, it's to change a mind versus using the performative creative act to cause more questions or to cause people to have a conversation. And I think that I, I think that that works become more interesting and that are better from an activist perspective when they are less rhetorical and more discursive. And so but that's yeah. just my opinion. But yeah. I'm wondering- well, I'll say that like the ambiguity, like I also think that, I mean, the ambiguity goes over certain types of people's heads too, right? Like we don't wanna take that, cause th that ambiguity was part of the, the performance art as well. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's going over the head of most of the people we wanted to hear this, hmm. I think, which is a really interesting point to make too, that like they, like, I, I, I also am trying to not be so um, like left versus right here, but the right really, they, they won't even give you a second to defend yourself or explain what you were trying to do because they see it as defamation, as these negative things. And so maybe that ambiguity, while it was really important and for the art of the project, mm -hmm. maybe that took away from the activism of it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And then I pop in and this is where it was one good thing. There were a few things that I got right as an activist. And one of this is that it was 
applying pressure directly to elect to elected officials and to government officials. And that was one of the main things, but it was so dependent and it was participatory. You want people to be in on it. You want people to think about it. But again, it was not, it was too dependent on the participatory aspect in order to reach the government officials too. Did any of your blue lines get taken down or get defaced in any way? Did you, do you know if that happened? I found out when I was arrested that putting up painter's tape in the subway is uh, illegal. Like that could be, you, stickering mm -hmm. is like still considered vandalism. So they definitely, uh, they definitely were taken down. Um, but like I said, on that truck, it was on that moving truck for years, they repainted it and there is still a part of my tape on there. And every time I see it, I'm so excited. I've seen it in Manhattan. I've seen it all throughout the city. Um, it's in my neighborhood. So that's why I got it in the first place. But, uh, but yeah, so some of the blue lines actually remain and some, but the rest like, yeah, they disappeared. I haven't seen one in a little while. I would love to see someone who thinks that climate change is absolute shit to like retaliate by taking down your blue lines, right? That would be amazing. Or, red lines. <laughs> or, yeah. or, some, or something, or there right? Or were, there were the flyers like that had the pull tabs, like something like that. I'm sure people would have taken down. Yeah. Um, or uh, yeah, in my hate mail too, I got people were angry and they were like, you're dumb, climate change isn't real. Shut up, shut up, you dumb dumb. Could I propose one more thought? And then that's all of everything that's on my list. <laughs> uh, Courtney, you know, I, I, I love engaging and this was an extremely engaging presentation for me. Um, it, it's from a little bit further at the beginning of the presentation, but one thing I wanted to bring up, because um, Vera had said um, for the people that Courtney inspired um, and the d definition of activist versus artist, my, because we, we know what Courtney is. She's an artistic activist, right? She, she carries both sides of that. My question is the people that Courtney did inspire, are they activists or are they artists? And with that, what separates those identities? Does, when, when Courtney passes off her ideas to these people, is she passing that identity of art and activism or is she simply planting a seed for that person to kind of make their own journey from it. That, yeah, that was just one of the other abstract- No, that was on my list. It. it was really- No, no, it was on my list too. So yeah, because because Vera said um, something about, you know, everyone's an artist, but that, you know, there's a difference between someone who is an artist, someone who is an artisan, right? An artisan. And there's someone who's an, and there are people who are idea generators. So there are all these sort of words and like, they all mean different things. But it, in this case, I think it is very hard because if someone can do a beautiful straight blue line somewhere, they're, they're a, could we, could we consider them like a craft person, right? Cause they're able to install something really beautifully. Um, do we, if someone, whoever did the thing with the blue line up in the airport with the Dunkin' Donuts thing, that's an idea generator type person. And all of these are creative acts. And so these words, they're useful, but they also are very ambiguous in this in this context. So how about stepping stepping the curb? If, oh yeah, yeah. Can, can just add something to this. Yeah, and there's of course the 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 di one difference would be. I mean, these blue lines were not decorative. I mean, obviously not. I mean, there's a difference if you do something that's decorative to kind of sort of beautify and that's of course the idea that you kind of and, and that's of course one of the dilemmas in 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 aesthetics you know to beautify or to make something that's kind of maybe even yelling out and that's not even beautiful right it's kind of it's called vandalism you vandalize something and as opposed to beautify things. So, um, and I think that's that's kind of an important issue. So there's an, there's, is a difference basically in the concept and in, in your intention and you know, what you intend to reach. Um, does anyone else have questions? Things they want to address? We're at a little over an hour, so. I mean, I could sit here and talk with Courtney and Vera all day long. Yeah, <laughs> and probably too. Jimmy and, too, it seems and, like. <laughs> and and I, I hate to say that I have to go very soon. And it's really been a pleasure. 
and it's been such a pleasure, you know, and I think we'll continue this and actually meet in person. Yeah. So One I'll just give my days. Vera is super cool. Vera is so cool. I'm so oh, happy to know her. Courtney I can't wait. I... Yeah. Well, I'm going to do my little sum up then. So we'll and turn the know, record off and then fun. we can talk some more. Um, so um, want to plug the next discussion like this, which is on June 30th, which is next week. And it's at five o'clock um, um, central as well. And it's with um, artist scholar Vita Pivo and scholar Parrish Conkling. She's a philosopher and it's called The Concrete Age, Materials and the Crisis of Capitalism. So I'm just going to read really quickly what this is because it's going to be awesome. Um, concrete is the second most consumed material on earth after water, yet few of us know what it is, where it comes from, and who makes it. Join Vita and Parrish in a conversation that examines the material's fascinating history in the U.S., from its origins in the Lehigh Valley, its expansion to the U.S. South, empire um, in the global South, and colonization to outer space. The discussion will consider why we continue to rely on this material for the construction of seemingly everything and we'll put concrete into the broader context of sustainability and climate change. And so this is um, Vita's um, dissertation work, which is being put into a book. I mean, who gets their dissertation put into a book for University of Chicago Press? That would really be good ones. Yeah, that really would be Vita. Ones. That sounds <laughs> really cool. I don't know if you can see my face, but that sounds amazing. Yeah, that's it's going to be yeah. it's going to be great. Um, so yeah, so please join us yeah, wow. for that. Um, I, there's an event on Facebook. Um, we'll do something on Instagram and then it's all, there's also information on my website, which is JeanetteJoyHarris.me. So with that, I say thank you to everyone. I'm going to, I'm going to hit stop recording, oh, but if you, you. people want to stay on, then um, they can stay on. Thank you so much, Courtney and Vera. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, everybody who came. Thank this you. has been so thank delightful. You. And thank you I'm for the opportunity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Bye. We'll catch up later, Vera. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll catch up. And